in the world of monsters. Most people know that King Kong and Godzilla exist. So, where do these two monsters come from? And what kind of relationship do they have? What other monsters exist in the world of monsters? Monarch, Legacy of Monsters. The latest TV series will provide us with answers. Let's get into today's story with the topic. Three fearless individuals walk towards the tower. A monster's lair appears underground. The woman wants to reach out and collect samples, but one lucky person steps on unstable ground. Soon, an unfortunate event occurs. Oh my God, go, go, go! This all started in 1973. The military's entry unveiled the mystery of Skull Island. King Kong, as the ruler of Skull Island, directly decimated thus military. A company and scientist Andrew, in despair, records his last words with a camera. Before he could finish speaking, Andrew starts running frantically. It turns out a long-legged spire monster in the forest notice him. Chased by the monster, Andrew escapes all the way to the seashore. At the end, there is only a cliff. At this moment, Andrew has nowhere to retreat. In the moment of crisis, Andrew throws his backpack into the sea. Just when Andrew was desperate, the crab-like monster beneath his feet is suddenly disturbed. The crab-like monster engages in a fierce battle with the spider monster to protect its territory. The conflict between the two colossal beasts creates an opportunity for Andrew to escape. The entangled two colossal beasts plunge into the sea together. While Andrew feels relieved, he also sighs with regret as his years of hard work sink into the sea. Because his backpack contains information about the Titan monsters, in the blink of an eye, the time shifts to the year 2013, a cold region in Japan. Fishermen discover Andrew's backpack among their salvaged catch, and his discovery gradually reveals the secrets of the Titan monsters. Two years later, Andrew's daughter Lisa lands in Japan aboard a flight. She holds her father's rental contract in Japan, intending to investigate her father's cause of death. After the plane lands, disinfection personnel sanitize everyone. Since Godzilla landed in Japan, people believe that eliminating parasites from their bodies can prevent attracting monsters. Lost in thought, Lisa recalls the disaster from a year ago. She was a first-hand witness to Godzilla's invasion at that time. Lisa is a teacher. Their school bus was crossing a bridge at that time. Godzilla's sudden intrusion put the entire school bus in danger. While she was evacuating the children, Godzilla's shaking caused the school bus to fall off the bridge. This scene also became an unforgettable memory for Lisa. To cope with monster invasions, Japanese authorities have long established evacuation routes. However, not everyone believes in the existence of monsters. When Lisa takes a taxi, the driver expresses his belief that the attack on San Francisco was a hoax. He thinks Godzilla is nothing more than special effects created by movie studios. Lisa simply smiles without saying a word. Subsequently, she arrives at the apartment address, using the key left by her father. Lisa opens the door. Nervously, she pushes open the door. A pile of women's shoes is placed at the entrance. What surprises her is, the living room filled with photos of her father with unfamiliar people. Lisa's appearance startles Alice. Tammy screamed woke up Tammy in the house. Tammy questions Lisa about her identity. Lisa, in turn, asks them why there are these photos. Tammy responds that the photos are of her family. Both sides look at each other in confusion. The situation becomes awkward. Unexpectedly, Lisa's father half formed to family simultaneously. They sit down to confront each other. Tammy asked the other party to prove that his father is Lisa's father. Then, Lisa took out a photo of their family. Alice didn't want to dwell on the past. She just wanted to know what happened to her husband. Lisa didn't know how to answer because she also wanted to know what happened to her father. So, Lisa awkwardly fled the scene. Shortly after Lisa left, a heavy alarm sounded in the city sky. The crowd began to move towards the shelter, and Lisa followed them to the shelter. There, she met Tammy and her son. In this critical moment, Alice was still concerned about her husband, but Lisa stated that her father wasn't with them at that time. The shadows of the past overwhelmed Lisa's emotions, and in a panic, she wanted to escape from there. However, with Alice's consolation, she quickly calmed down. 
the time goes back to 1959, where Dr. Tracy and Andrew were together. They hoped to track the source of radiation, to find the whereabouts of the monsters. After a long journey, they arrived at their destination, to protect themselves from radiation. All three of them wore gas masks. The fence was marked with radiation danger, but it didn't stop them from moving forward. They hadn't walked far when they encountered a man hunting. The hunter was very nervous, when faced with the intrusion of strangers. Both sides were at a standoff. Tracy quickly took off her mask and conveyed that they were scientists. They came here with the purpose of helping everyone. She persuaded the young men that the wild rabbits were contaminated by radiation, and consuming them would lead to cancer and death. The hunter emphasized that it was just a scare tactic, and in reality, the government had blown up a hole leading to hell. Guided by the hunter, Tracy and the others quickly discovered a factory. Tracy was surprised to find that there was no radiation there, so she boldly took off her mask in three steps. Subsequently, the three of them entered the factory, set up explosives, and David remotely detonated them. They quickly received a response, as the sonar indicated a massive cavity underground in the factory. Suddenly, the ground cracked open with a huge fissure, and the three of them walked towards the tower. There was a monster's nest here, with some monsters in an embryonic state, and juvenile creatures spread throughout the cave. It seemed like a nursery. David was very vigilant and believed that the mother monster was nearby. But Andrew wasn't worried. Brave Tracy decided to descend to the bottom to retrieve samples, and David had to assist her. However, when the two reached the bottom, Tracy hadn't collected the samples yet, and David caused the ground to collapse. The vibrations from the collapsing nest caused the juvenile monsters to break out of their shells, and they started chasing Tracy and David. In a panic, the two climbed up the rope, but at that moment, the monster suddenly grabbed Tracy. As more and more monsters appeared, Tracy, who had lost her balance, eventually fell down. Time goes back to the present. After the alarm was lifted, and people resumed their daily lives, at her mother's request, Tammy extended an invitation to Lisa. Her mother wanted to have a good conversation with her. However, Lisa did not want to discuss whose mother was the mistress. Tammy felt that it wasn't the focal point that everyone should be discussing. Under his guidance, the two of them went to their father's workshop. Lisa, being perceptive, didn't take long to discover her father's secret. Behind the map, there was a hidden safe. Lisa opened the safe using both her family's birthdays. Inside, she found Andrew's backpack. The backpack was filled with research materials on the Titan monsters. Lisa noticed the emblem of the Emperor organization. She sought Tammy's help to decipher the information. Coincidentally, Tammy's girlfriend Barry was skilled in household appliance repairs. Back at their residence, Mary took out the materials to repair them. She discovered that the data was encrypted with military technology. It was a significant challenge for Mary. However, when the data was finally decrypted, the Emperor organization located their signal. The technician quickly reported the situation to their superiors. Upon learning that the data could potentially be leaked, the leaders took it seriously. They decided to handle it secretly. Mary and the others stumbled upon the outpost's plans, but they were unaware of the significance of the symbols within. Lisa mentioned that she had noticed the emblem back in San Francisco. Perhaps this mysterious organization had known about the existence of the monsters long before. Mary believed that their father might have been a member of that organization. Tammy found it highly unlikely and believed that their father was with Lisa and them at the time. Lisa explained that her father found them in the evacuation camp after Godzilla attacked San Francisco five days earlier. However, her father didn't intend to take care of them and left immediately. Citing important matters, Lisa didn't know what her father had been up to. A week later, the police called and informed them that their father's plane had gone missing in a storm. If that was the case, the secrets in the data would surely unveil their father's identity. At that moment, Lisa discovered a photo. And to her surprise, the woman in the photo was her grandmother. And this woman happens to be Dr. Tracy. Now, let's shift our focus to David's story. David is an upright Marine Corps soldier. He couldn't stand his comrades harassing innocent women. So he got into a fight with them. One day, he received an assignment from his superiors to escort a Japanese scientist. David's task was to observe and report at all times. Upon arriving at the harbor, David quickly met the scientist. And to his surprise, Dr. Tracy turned out to be a woman. David is very curious about Dr. Tracy's purpose here. 
Tracy explained that atmospheric planes detected nuclear radiation over the Philippines. David suspected it was Russia's bomb experiment, but Tracy immediately denied that possibility, as the radioactive dust from the bomb wouldn't produce those isotopes. Tracy came here to figure out the truth behind this. They ventured deep into the forest. Tracy began her exploration. Just as they finished setting up the equipment, noises in the woods alerted Tracy. David happened to be away at that moment. While Tracy kept calling out, Andrew suddenly emerged from the forest. David arrived in time and subdued Andrew with his weapon. During the questioning, they learned that Andrew was a veteran, and he was currently a cryptozoologist studying non-existent animals. Following that, Andrew became curious about the instruments before them. Andrew felt that they might be looking for the same thing, and then Andrew started talking excitedly. There's a legend in these mountains, where a giant dragon carves a fiery path in the sky, which could also be a path of stray radiation. David wanted to dismiss Andrew, but Dr. Tracy hoped Andrew could join them on their journey. David refused, but Tracy didn't hold back and told David to leave. Embarrassed, David had no choice but to leave reluctantly, and so, the two of them embarked on their adventure. Andrew presented the evidence he had collected, and Tracy was astonished. She quickly took out the radiation readings from the area. To their surprise, the two sets of data overlapped. It seemed their discoveries were not coincidental. Guided by the map, they continued their exploration into the depths. Before long, they came across a heavily overgrown warship. Andrew was familiar with this warship. The Laden docked at Pearl Harbor sank into the sea. As early as 1943, Tracy was astonished by why the Lorden would appear here out of nowhere. In order to unravel the mystery, they ventured inside the ship. Decaying steel emitted chilling roars. Tracy felt uneasy, but Andrew plunged into the cabin. Inside a box, they discovered something that belonged to Andrew. It turned out he had served on this warship before. Back then, they were hit by an unidentified impact and everyone believed it was an attack by a Japanese submarine. But the truth was far more terrifying than a submarine. However, shortly after David left, a colorful aurora appeared in the sky, which shocked him immensely. He realized that Dr. Tracy and Andrew were in danger and quickly turned back. As Tracy and Andrew delved deeper, they discovered some strange slime inside the ship. Soon after, they came across several mummified bodies covered in the slime. A sense of foreboding filled both of them, as they retraced their steps. Fresh slime suddenly appeared in the hallway. The next moment, a monster swiftly attacked them. Andrew couldn't dodge in time and was pinned under a metal plate. Just in time, David arrived at the scene. With his help, Andrew managed to escape in the end. But after they fled the ship, a giant monster broke out of the vessel. Where did they end up? Was the nuclear radiation related to them? These questions would be Dr. Tracy's research focus. Now, let's jump back to the present timeline. Tammy was feeling upset due to her father's infidelity. She decided to vent her anger in her father's studio. Then, she noticed her father's filing cabinet, and to her surprise, the drawer opened with the key left by Lisa. When she took out the files, she didn't expect to find David's records and an old box of videotapes. Meanwhile, Lisa was preparing to take the subway home. Just as she was buying a ticket, members of the Imperial organization started tailing her, mistaking their presence for a romantic advance. Lisa was taken aback when Anna mentioned the files. He claimed to work for the Imperial organization and warned Lisa that as long as she handed over what she had taken, she wouldn't get into trouble. Lisa pretended to make a phone call as an excuse to go outside and took the opportunity to escape. However, she didn't get far before the Imperial organization caught her and forced her into a car. With a hood over her head, Lisa's terrified thoughts turned to a dreadful past. In her struggle, the vehicle accidentally veered off the road. Before Adam could recover, Lisa hurriedly fled the scene. At the same time, Tammy found Mary and asked her to help play the videotape. However, Mary refused and wanted him to leave immediately. Tammy insisted on retrieving the previous information, and Mary brushed him off saying he could come back tomorrow to collect it. Once Tammy left, Mary buried herself in studying the documents. After escaping, Lisa immediately went to the police station to report the incident and claimed that she was being pursued by bad people. The police, however, looked skeptical and assumed Lisa was intoxicated, so they dismissed her with a few casual remarks. 
Afterwards, Tammy returned home. The mother and son's relationship was deceived. In order to vent their depression, they, they started tearing up photos. Accidentally, Tammy bumped into David's photo. To ensure the safety of the information, Lisa immediately went to Mary's house. However, as she arrived at Mary's doorstep, Adam and his man had already found her. Mary quickly pulled her aside. They quietly escaped the scene. While Adam wasn't paying attention, Alice saw David's photo and mentioned that it was a close friend of Tammy's father. Tammy wondered why her father had never mentioned him. Just then, Adam and his men arrived. Before Tammy could react, Adam barged into the house and demanded that Tammy hand over the information or they would be in big trouble. Alice provided cover for Tammy. Under her mother's signal, Tammy pretended to go back inside to retrieve the information. Alice intentionally delayed. Tammy successfully escaped the scene. Adam realized his mistake when he saw Tammy's father's photo. However, Tammy had already fled. With Mary's help, the three of them met at a noodle shop, panicked. Mary wanted to run away, but Tammy knew where they should go. Soon, they arrived at a retirement home. It turned out that David had been living there since retiring. In Tammy's introduction, David learned that both of them were Andrew's grandchildren. David openly stated that he was closely monitored by the Imperial organization if they were targeted by them. No matter where they fled, the organization's people would find them. David decided to escape from the retirement home in order to help these young people. That's the content of the first episodes of Imperial Plan. Monster Heritage, the good news, is that the third episode of the Imperial Plan is already available. In this episode, not only is Godzilla's origin explained, but new monsters also make an appearance. Will the female protagonist and her friends be able to escape? Friends will haven't watched it yet. Don't miss out. Stay tuned. See you in the next issue. In front of the powerful giant beast, even the steel giant is vulnerable. Let alone humans, what would they be like in front of even higher level monsters? Men are completely powerless against the suction force of the abyssal giant's mouth. Come the male and female protagonists escape and survive. Having lost a comrade, where should they go from here? Let's first outline the storyline of the entire movie. One plotline is set around 1954, when Godzilla first appeared in the public's view. At that time, the military established the monarch organization to guard against the appearance of monsters worldwide. The other plotline is set after 2013 when several young people led by David encounter various monsters while searching for Professor Bernie, Tracy, and Tammy's father. Next, let's start with a storyline from around 1954. David and the two doctors discover the existence of monsters and seek military funding to continue their exploration and research. General Bill, at that time, attaches great importance to this matter, so he visits the three of them with his subordinates. General Bill needs a compelling reason from them. David and the others present a giant footprint to General Bill, which was found in a muddy area in Indonesia. What is strange is that such a huge Bigfoot has disappeared since then. General Bill is greatly shocked. Dr. Andrew hopes to use radioactive materials to lure the creature out. Tracy explains to General Bill, that they discovered several abnormal radiation belts in the thermocline, which are directly related to the appearance of the giant creature. After the giant creature disappears, the radiation levels in that area suddenly decrease as well. Tracy speculates that the radiation might have been absorbed by the monster. In any case, this giant creature poses a significant threat to national and even global security. General Bill takes this matter very seriously, but he needs to carefully consider the 68 kilogram uranium mass. Not long after, they arrive at Bikini Atoll. The three of them, full of anticipation, meet General Bill again, but realize that the plan is not progressing as scheduled. Originally, the 68 kilograms of uranium they needed was directly replaced by General Bill with a nuclear bomb. David approaches General Bill to demand an explanation. General Bill and the higher-ups in the army have a simple idea. Since the enormous creature poses a threat, they should directly eliminate it with a nuclear bomb without risking their lives to obtain samples for further research. At this point, the nuclear bomb has been set up and General Buell and his team retreat to a safe location, waiting for the creature to take the bait. 
David mutters that if the monster doesn't appear, they won't be able to secure funding from the military. However, Tracy hopes that the monster doesn't appear. Suddenly, the sonar device on the side malfunctions. Immediately after, roars of a monster can be heard in the distance. Dr. Andrew quickly grabs a video camera and from a distance sees a gigantic spine. Everyone starts speculating if it could be a reappearance of dinosaurs from the Cretaceous period. Godzilla emerges from the sea. It swiftly dashes towards the location of the nuclear bomb. Tracy becomes worried once again. She didn't want to let the monster die without doing any research. Godzilla has been hiding in the ocean all this time. There have never been reports of attacks by unidentified creatures anywhere in the world. After hearing Tracy's suggestion, David provides feedback to General Beale. General Beale tells him that when facing unfamiliar monsters, they must strike first to avoid defeat. There is a signal transmitter nearby. The detonation signal will reach the nuclear bomb in 30 seconds. At that time, the nuclear bomb will undoubtedly deliver a fatal blow to Godzilla. Tracy still feels that the approach is inappropriate. She wants to stop the signal transmitter. David quickly runs over and embraces Tracy when he sees that. He knows that General Bill's orders must not be disobeyed. Such an action by Tracy will only get her arrested and thrown into jail. And General Bill will still detonate that bomb. When the countdown ends, the nuclear bomb detonates as scheduled. The explosion scene on the sea surface is magnificent. The soldiers all cheer and rejoice. They believe Godzilla is undoubtedly dead. Tracy's heart is filled with extreme sadness. The storyline from 1954 comes to an end. The story jumps to 2013. At this time, David is in a place similar to a retirement home for military personnel. In reality, he is under close surveillance by the monarch organization. Lisa, Tammy, and Mary come to this place. They inquire about their father's whereabouts from David. David is also excited to see them. He drives away from pursuers and escapes through the back door of this prison-like place. Then, they board a ferry to South Korea to meet one of David's old friends. Here, David finds the videotape that Dr. Andrew threw into the sea. Mary digitizes all the data using computer technology. They only need to open the computer to access the information. For safety reasons, they directly threw the videotape into the sea. The Monarch Organization was established in 1940. Initially, they monitored the appearance of monsters worldwide. Now they have started surveilling individuals involved in investigating monsters. David and the others had to take a smuggling route to avoid inspection. However, when they arrived in South Korea, they encountered difficulties at the customs office. They didn't have passports and were escorted to the police station for questioning. David pleaded with the police officers. He hoped to resolve the issues with money. However, the police officers remained unsympathetic. At that moment, a police officer named Rachel approached from the side. He saw David insulting himself. He punched David in the stomach. The other police officers joined in as well. Unexpectedly, the police officers directly put the two police officers into the car. It turns out that Rachel is the old friend David mentioned. Later, they quickly escaped by car to a small airstrip next to the train station. A small twin-engine aluminum plane was parked there. They relied on it to travel thousands of miles to Alaska. David introduced Professor Bernie's story to the children on the plane. When Bernie joined the Monarch Organization, David and the others were already retired. The Monarch Organization is no longer dedicated to tracking monsters and is only focused on collecting data and reducing budgets. Mary quickly pinpointed a coordinate through something on the previous videotape. That's where Professor Bernie disappeared. They can only find Bernie by going there. After a long day and night of flying, when they were nearing their destination, the plane suddenly experienced abnormalities. The instruments malfunctioned. David quickly took over the pilot's seat. He asked Lisa to find a bottle of water from under the driver's seat and placed it in front of David. Now, they had an improvised attitude indicator. David quickly pulled the gear lever. The plane began a stunt flying performance. The plane shook more and more violently. The others panicked, but David remained calm and quickly chose an excellent spot for an emergency landing. He pulled the lever. The plane touched the ground and glided for a distance before a successful forced landing. Everyone marveled at David's piloting skills. They walked outside to explore the snowy terrain. They quickly found scattered wreckage of another plane. Unfortunately, airplane fragments were scattered everywhere. The front of the plane was blown off directly. Tammy walked up and discovered someone at the pilot's seat. 
Upon closer inspection, she realized it wasn't her father. Meanwhile, Rachel noticed a tent not far away. However, when he went inside, he found nothing, but the tent was filled with various items. David was puzzled. If the plane didn't make a successful landing, then whose belongings were these? Soon, Lisa found a few lines of writing on a map. Those words were written in her father Bernie's handwriting. Their search direction must be correct. However, Rachel noticed something unusual again. Rather than entering the tent, he investigated the scene outside. Based on a rope nailed in the snow, he deduced that the plane should have landed smoothly. But why was the plane torn apart? Soon, Rachel discovered a large claw mark on the plane wreckage. He shouted loudly towards his teammates, urging them to escape quickly. He went to start the plane. While the others were running, the ground started to shake. Rachel quickly put on his headphones and started the plane's engine. The next moment, a colossal creature had emerged from the snow. Rachel attempted to attack the monster with the propeller, but was swatted aside by the creature's pump. The others were all terrified. What's even more surprising is that the monster's belly is covered in fleshy bone tendrils. It took a deep breath. To everyone's surprise, it breathes out and instantly freezes the plane in front of it. Unfortunately, Rachel turns into an ice sculpture as a result. It seems that the attack on Professor Bernie's plane must have been caused by this monster. Come the main characters successfully escape Godzilla's attacks. Where did Godzilla exactly come from? What other strange monsters will the main characters encounter? The above is from episode 3 of The Monster Legacy and The Emperor's Plan. Don't miss it, dear viewers who love it. See you in the next episode. A giant monster rises from the ground. It roars relentlessly as it chases after humans. A desperate woman collapses on the ground. She only has a backpack to defend herself. Will the woman be able to overcome the predicament? Find out in the fourth episode of the Monster Legacy series, The Emperor's Plan. After losing an important comrade, the main characters face a powerful monster with freezing abilities. What is its true purpose? In this desperate situation, what choices will the main characters make? Let's wait and see. Continuing from the previous story, a worker at the outpost notices unusual readings on the monitor. She immediately contacts headquarters. Meanwhile, the ferocious monster bites down on the plane. A piece of wreckage flies out, attracting the monster's attention. It notices the humans, and starts moving towards Tammy. Strangely, Tammy shows no fear. In the next moment, Tammy unexpectedly picks up a signal gun. He fires a shot into the distance. The giant monster becomes confused, seeing that his action has no effect. The man can only run for his life. They find an ice cave. They break the ice pillars at the entrance and hide inside. In this tense moment, David doesn't forget to tease Tammy. Nice shot, kid. He says, soon, the monster finds its way to them. The four of them tremble inside the ice cave. They dare not make a sound. The monster is close at hand. Its footsteps crack the thin layer of ice beneath Mary's feet. Mary is too focused on observing above and completely ignores the danger beneath her feet. Suddenly, Mary gets stuck in the icy water. With the help of the others, she is rescued. In those few seconds, Mary's leg becomes frostbitten. She is in immense pain but cannot make a sound, as it would attract the monster's attention. They didn't know how long it had been, but the monster finally left. David goes to investigate and confirms the monster's disappearance. Mary immediately cries out in pain, but David covers her mouth. Facing such a colossal monster, confronting it head-on is unrealistic. They can only choose to retreat. Mary's leg is throbbing in pain. After David and Lisa leave, Tammy helps Mary up. Mary, feeling desperate, blames Tammy. Did you bring me here just to get hurt? She says angrily. She walks away in anger. It turns out that the two of them met in Tokyo a year ago. At that time, Tammy was a somewhat famous artist. His biggest wish was to prove himself successful to his father, Professor Bernie, who always mysteriously disappeared. This made Tammy feel down and discouraged. In addition, things in art galleries are very complicated. His mother was proud of his achievements, but Tammy didn't feel the same way. He went outside to catch his breath. That's when he coincidentally met Mary while taking photos. Mary thought he was taking pictures of her without permission. That's when they started talking. Mary commented on the pretentious name of one of his gallery pieces, but Tammy praised it. Mary asked him to delete the photo. He asked her why she didn't like being photographed. Your photos look great, he said. This ambiguous statement caught Mary's attention. They continued talking and made plans to meet at a bar for a drink. He met Mary and fell in love at first sight. The scene shifts, and they are walking in the snowy landscape. 
An irritated Mary asks David why he has studied so many monsters and yet seems useless at this critical moment. Only then does David tell them that, according to the Emperor's organization's information, monsters are collectively referred to as giants. Their forms are like snowflakes, each with different characteristics. They have no idea how many monsters are lurking. This is not the right time for a lecture. Lisa informs everyone, they can't just wander aimlessly. Once they encounter darkness and the temperature drops, combined with the fact that they have no food, if they don't find a place to take shelter, they might not make it through the night. David suggests heading northwest, as there might be people there. Tammy expresses his thoughts. Before the plane crash, he saw a giant golf ball. There might be a human supply station there. David asks if anyone else saw it. They all said no. Tammy is surprised that his girlfriend doesn't support him. Can't you trust me like you used to? That was when they had just met. Tammy takes Mary to a secret bar. He designed the lighting here. Mary is pleasantly surprised. She admires Tammy's talent. They talk about their respective careers. Tonight is actually Tammy's first exhibition. He purposely arrived late to build anticipation among the audience. Mary asks if bringing her here is also part of the show. Tammy turns around and earnestly says it's not. In the evening, the relationship between the two people who had a good chat got closer. Mary sees Tammy's artwork at his place, and she thinks he's a talented artist. The beginning of any relationship is always sweet. The scene shifts to the present. The four of them are climbing a towering snow mountain. When they reach a higher point and look around, they don't see the supply station Tammy mentioned. Due to their differing opinions, Tammy insists that he didn't hallucinate. At this moment, Lisa sees a glowing spot in the distance. They want to head in that direction, but Tammy pours cold water on their enthusiasm. He thinks they might encounter obstacles along the way. The supply station he saw is relatively close, and he insists on checking it out. In the end, they split up to search for support. Tammy goes alone to find the supply station, while David and the other three head northwest. In Alaska, the Monitor reports to the superiors that a gamma ray suddenly appeared. The superiors prepare to send an analysis team. The scene shifts to David's team, where Mary's legs are frostbitten. Lisa has to carry her forward. Mary is very weak, and Lisa encourages her with words. They walk through the night and end up back at the tent. They are shocked by this. David says that as long as the monster is there, it will definitely affect us. The extraordinary nature of this area is unimaginable. Lisa glances at Mary, who is lying on the ground. She is very concerned. Mary's condition is extremely poor right now, and if she doesn't warm up, it could be life-threatening. With Lisa's insistence, David can only light a fire next to the tent. Mary's condition starts to improve. She also instructs Lisa that if anything happens to her, she asks Lisa to contact her family. During their conversation, David hands them food. Before long, an unforeseen event occurs. The ground suddenly shakes violently, and the creature beneath the ice approaches at an incredibly fast speed. David quickly tells them to run. They've only gone a few meters when the ground becomes calm again. David orders them to stop and not let the monster know their location. The next moment, the monster suddenly appears. Strangely, the monster targets the fire next to them, then it disappears. The humans are unharmed. Sharp-minded David realizes that the monster isn't chasing them, it's merely running towards the fire. The monster attacking the plane was attracted by the engine, and the reason it attacked humans is likely due to the signal flare. David comes up with a brilliant idea to use the nearby aviation fuel against the monster. They need to quickly reach the coastal area. Mary, who has just regained consciousness, looks at the nearby bodies of her companions and hesitates. She told Lisa that I would never be able to withstand it. At necessary moments, you can abandon me. Meanwhile, Tammy, who is searching for the supply station, is lost in the darkness of the night. He can't see any signs of life around him. Even his water bottle has frozen. He feels a wave of despair. Tammy walks slower and slower in the wind and snow. He wants to give up on the snowy ground. He can't hold on and collapses on the ground, not knowing how much time has passed. He turns his head and sees his girlfriend. Tammy recalls the good times they had before. Mary encourages herself not to feel ashamed of her work. The light that night is just like tonight. A voice comes from the darkness. Tammy realizes that it's his father's voice. Immediately after, Professor Bernie staggers as he walks, but he doesn't seem to see Tammy. When Tammy wakes up, he realizes it was an illusion, but strangely, he finds some pencil shavings on the ice. This also makes him think of his father. Perhaps his father had been to this place. In a daze, a force pulls him forward. He arrives at his own art gallery. He also sees his father. He cries to his father about the hardships of organizing an exhibition. Bernie says, you made me proud. In an instant, the gallery returns to reality. Tammy finds the golf ball shaped supply station. Although there is no one inside the supply station, there is a satellite phone that can be used here. David said goodbye to his good friend Rachel. He poured aviation fuel around Rachel. 
he was also sending Rachel off on her final journey. Just then, the sound of airplane engines could be heard in the distance. Suddenly, a monster emerged from the ground. It launched an attack on Lisa and them. Lisa supported Mary as they ran towards the airplane. Mary, with her injured leg, couldn't keep up and fell to the ground. The monster chased closely behind. In a dire situation, Mary raised her backpack in front of her. Her backpack instantly turned into a block of ice. On the side, David, being a true man, shouted for a long time but couldn't attract the monster. Then he quickly took out a lighter and ignited it. The sudden explosion indeed caught the monster's attention. At that moment, the airplane also noticed Mary and Lisa. David was somewhat dizzy from the earlier explosion. He staggered and stood up. He saw the monster next to him extinguish the fire. Then he ran towards the direction of the airplane. After the plane landed, they discovered it was the support Tammy had found. Finally, they managed to safely board the plane. On the plane, Tammy recounted her journey to find the supply station. Unfortunately, Mary's laptop was frozen and damaged. All the information about the monsters recorded in the computer was destroyed. However, David was captivated by the scene outside the plane. Several beams of magical light emanated from a cave. Even the experienced David was somewhat astonished. The time shifted to Utah in the year 2015. Monitors detected highly unusual gamma rays. The last time such gamma rays occurred, was when Godzilla attacked San Francisco. This caught the attention of the Monarch organization. It was highly likely a precursor to a new round of Godzilla attacks. Now, what actions should humans take? What plans will the Monarch organization devise? What strange monsters will the main characters encounter? Where did these monsters come from? Will Godzilla make a comeback? Let's look forward to the next episode. All right, that's it for today's video. See you in the next episode. The frost monster reached out its giant claw, attempting to stop the helicopter from taking off. As they passed by, David looked aside and saw a colorful aurora illuminating the sky. At the end of the fourth installment, the four main characters finally managed to escape from a near-death situation. Little did they know, they once again fell into the hands of the Emperor organization. They were imprisoned and separated from each other. Both Lisa and Tammy displayed strong resistance emotions. Carrying a damaged laptop, Dua entered the room where Mary was being held captive. Dua believed that Mary must have left a backup in advance. Although Mary couldn't move while lying down, she kept swearing at them. Mary suggests that they should go after the beast. Dua found several fake passports belonging to Mary and then left a business card. He coldly exited the room. When Dua returned to the surveillance room, he reported his opinions to the two leaders. He believed that Lisa and Tammy were just ordinary people and could hardly be of any help in dealing with the giant monster. However, Mary was different. Although she wasn't officially wanted, her behavior indicated that she was hiding her past. Tim advocated for informing Lisa and Tammy that they had the blood of the Emperor organization flowing in their bodies. They should be recruited into the organization. Dua supported this idea. If Lisa and Tammy insisted on finding their father, Bernie, they would inevitably become involved with the Emperor organization. The most troublesome issue was how to deal with the veteran David. Tammy, Mary, and Lisa were released. Tim personally provided them with passports and apologized for his mistakes. After playing the family card, Tim raised his voice and warned the three young people that they had recklessly entered a dangerous world. While their lives are still alive, they should go home and live a peaceful life as soon as possible. Then, in a huff, Tim climbed into the car. Dua praised Tim for improving his acting skills. The three of them entered the airport, preparing to take a flight back to Tokyo. However, Tammy stepped forward and opposed the idea. She claimed that Tokyo was no longer their home. And besides, David's fate was uncertain, and his father Bernie's whereabouts were unknown. They had finally confirmed that David was alive, and they couldn't give up now. Bernie had a studio in San Francisco, and it was worth trying their luck there. Mary had no choice but to admit that she had backup data. However, she felt that continuing on this path could put their lives in danger. Lisa took the opportunity to persuade Mary. The scene shifted back to the room where David was being held captive by the Emperor organization. Suddenly, a bright light illuminated the wall, and a projector started playing a video recording of David and Dr. Andrew. David was instantly moved to tears. At that moment, the door opened, and a female leader walked in. David recognized her as Weir, the deputy director of the Emperor organization. The two were familiar with each other. We released David from the handcuffs, but David was not grateful. David had been oppressed by the younger generation in the organization for over a decade, and he had no desire to cooperate with the current leadership. We reminded David that a few days ago, he had brought three civilians to Alaska, and they almost lost their lives because of him. David started to argue back, stating that the three young individuals had achieved more in recent years than the Emperor organization. We continued to pressure him, stating that if David didn't cooperate, he would remain in captivity. In the surveillance room, Dewar asked him a question. Dewar couldn't believe that David had joined the organization after 1950, which would make him over 90 years old. 
Jiwa can't tell at all, David is really weird. Tim also didn't know, only heard that David made a mistake during a mission. The specific details of David's error are a secret, and how David managed to escape from the nursing home, and then immediately discover the Titan monster. We provided David with food. She changed her attitude, intended to continue persuading David. David, of course, was not satisfied. What has the Emperor organization been doing? The organization even allowed Godzilla and Mothra to battle. Did the organization ever consider? What would happen if Godzilla lost? We changed the subject. She continued to pressure David for information about DR. Andrew, what other secrets are in the data? David was annoyed. These are all facts that you all know, but you refuse to believe. He looked up at the camera and issued a warning. The Emperor organization has taken the wrong path. The Emperor organization has been making mistakes for a long time, continuing to follow the perspective of the three young individuals. They flew from Tokyo to San Francisco. Lisa's mother's colleague, James, picked them up in a small truck. Lisa showed resistance, probably sensing that. James and her mother may have more than just a colleague relationship. They were on their way back home. Their conversation mentioned, after San Francisco became a ruin, residents were relocated to the suburbs. Of course, some people took the opportunity to organize tours of the ruins. Tammy's mother had signed up before. Presumably, she is looking for Bernie's whereabouts. James stopped the car in the community. Lisa's mother, Caroline, ran out of the house. She gave her daughter a big hug. Then she warmly welcomed two guests from Tokyo. Lisa didn't want to waste time. She introduced this person as Tammy. She discovered her father's other family in Tokyo. Caroline forced a smile. She invited the guests into the house. The room was somewhat messy, because the jobs that Caroline and James work in are. They came from the destroyed old city. They search for meaningful items for the residents. Lisa asked Tammy and Mary to go to her room, so that she could talk privately with her mother. When Caroline learned that Lisa wanted to explore Bernie's studio at night, Caroline expressed strong opposition. The military has sealed off the devastated area. The military deals with looters inside, either by arresting or killing them. But Lisa's attitude was very determined. Her mother had no choice but to compromise. In the evening, the group boarded a small truck and arrived at the checkpoint of the reconstruction area. Caroline bribed the guards with money and passed through smoothly. Caroline stopped the car in an uninhabited area. She let three young people out. Caroline reminded them to gather back here at 8 a.m., because the checkpoint would close in another 15 minutes. The three of them left the main road. They walked towards the destroyed buildings. Lisa walked on familiar streets. The once bustling community had become a home for stray cats. They walked a little further. The three of them almost ran into patrolling soldiers. They had to crouch down. They hid behind a nearby vehicle. The soldiers issued a warning, ordering them to come out obediently. Tammy had a quick idea. He threw a bag of chips behind the soldiers. Immediately, several cats gathered to eat. The soldiers saw that it was cats. They cursed and disbanded, although they continued to move forward in the dark. Tammy, to lighten the mood, he took the lead in singing the advertising song. Lisa remembered. This is also what his father would do when he makes him happy. She couldn't help but join in singing. They finally relaxed for a few minutes. When the three of them turned a corner, they encountered resting soldiers not far away. The soldiers clearly saw the three of them. One of them grabbed a weapon and chased after them. The three of them hid in the basement of a building. Lisa's phobia immediately kicked in. Help me. Tammy and Mary on the left and right. They pulled Lisa and hid behind the wall. Several people living in the basement. They drew the attention of the soldiers. The three of them took the opportunity to run in the opposite direction. However, as they approached the ruins, Lisa remembered the Tesla incident that day. She was always unwilling to walk under the rubble. Her two companions kept encouraging Lisa. The three of them moved forward and backward together. Finally, Lisa regained her courage. The three of them walked in the underground passage for a while. They found that it was all dead ends. Lisa remembered the scene when her father said goodbye to her. She vented her anger towards Tammy. Both of them knew that Lisa had psychological trauma. Tammy suggested exploring an exit on his own. Mary continued to comfort Lisa, to help her calm down. After only a while, Tammy came back with good news. He followed the cats and found an exit. The three of them searched for the sound of cats. They indeed walked out of the underground passage. Not far away was Bernie's former studio. The three of them arrived safely at the empty building. They found Bernie's studio. Tammy remembered the office in Tokyo, but there was no second safe on the wall. Lisa noticed that map. They realized that it was indeed a world map, but the five continents were missing. Mary pulled out a tablet. She found the map from DR. Andrew's files. Tammy suddenly had a brilliant idea. How putting one image on another can reveal something completely new. Tammy created through projection. He combined the marked points on the tablet with the map. The locations where the giant creatures appeared were marked on the map, and the next coordinate point on the map was in Africa. 
Bernie must be heading to that location. The three of them took the map and left the studio. They successfully returned home by riding in a small truck. Lisa said goodbye to her mother, Caroline. Lisa revealed the news that her father, Bernie, was still alive, and she planned to follow in her father's footsteps. Lastly, Mary avoided everyone. She dialed Dewar's phone number. She reported the latest discoveries. Although the Titan monsters didn't appear in this episode, it filled in the worldview of the Emperor's plan for us. The main group planned to go to Africa. In Africa, what kind of new monsters will we encounter? Let's look forward to the next episode. Alright, that's it for today's video. See you in the next episode. Godzilla, whom we haven't seen for a long time, has finally reappeared once again. The people have been searching for Bernie for a long time, and he will also make an appearance. David, the founder of the Monarch Organization, why was he imprisoned? Today, we will finally get the answer. Without further ado, let's get into today's story. After the Monarch Organization released Lisa and the others, David was secretly detained with a hood over his head. But during the delivery, a car suddenly intercepted their path. When the guards opened the door, they discovered that the incoming person was Dua. Colonel, d'après votre dossier, vous parlez français. Si c'est vrai, raclez-vous la gorge. As the car shook, the two guards were successfully killed. David was a bit confused. Why would she betray the organization? And Dua explained that it was because of her sister. She died on the day when the monsters landed in San Francisco. That's why she joined the Monarch organization. She did it to eliminate all the monsters. However, it's unfortunate that the Monarch organization's attitude towards the monsters is completely inactive. So, she with the people who also want a revenge found another leader. And David was the best candidate because they believed he could lead them in the right direction and track the monsters. In order to quickly reunite with Lisa and the others, David had no choice but to agree for now. Let's go back to the timeline of 1955. Since the military conducted a nuclear test at Bikini Atoll, there have been no traces of Godzilla in the world. After this incident, the military-established monarch organization gained significant fame. However, the military believed that the threat of the giant beasts no longer existed. They used the funds originally allocated to the monarch organization to hold a luxurious party. The party was extravagant, but Tracy felt very uncomfortable. However, in order to continue their work, they had to comply with the arrangements. They had to find more traces of the monsters. Only then could they keep the monarch organization alive. Coincidentally, at this time, Andrew received a report of abnormal radiation levels from the island of Iajima. This was connected to their previous findings of Godzilla's origin and the wreckage of the Aratrum at Bikini Atoll. The radiation levels emitted by the giant black bats are identical. So, Andrew and Tracy decided to take a step ahead. David was left at the base to take charge. They quickly arrived at the incident location. Here, they met with Dr. Suzuki, who discovered the anomaly. To lure the monster out, Dr. Suzuki actually created a gamma radiation ball. They placed the sphere in the center of the lake. Now they just needed to activate the machine remotely and wait quietly for the monster to take the bait. While the three of them waited in silence, David, who was supposed to stay at the monarch organization, unexpectedly arrived here. It turns out that when Andrew came here, he had been in contact with David, keeping him updated on the progress. When David heard about the progress, he was also filled with anticipation, so he didn't greet them and came here directly. Andrew was happy to see his assistant and introduced David to Dr. Suzuki. However, Tracy, standing behind them, had a strange expression, as if she didn't welcome David's arrival. The reason she wasn't happy about David's arrival was that they were going through a breakup. David, as a military man, had to follow orders. But Tracy's approach to dealing with monsters went against the militaries, causing disagreement between them. Tracy needed a man who fully supported her, which is why she ultimately chose to be with Andrew. Tracy thought David's arrival indicated something unexpected, but David only wanted to meet her. Just as David and Tracy were arguing, the radiation ball in the middle of the lake suddenly disappeared. The next second, their attention was completely drawn to the radiation ball that dropped on the shore. Everyone turned their heads and... saw Godzilla slowly emerging from the lake. The timeline goes back to 2015, where David and Lisa have successfully reunited. They traveled all the way to the Algerian desert, and according to the coordinates calculated from the map, Lisa's father may be in front of them. However, Mary in the back seat suddenly asked Dua when she could go home. Dua responded that their plans couldn't keep up with the changes. 
but he promised that all promises will definitely be fulfilled. The premise is that they can all safely from the desert. While they were talking, they had already reached their destination. After some investigation, they finally saw Lisa's father. Unexpectedly, he was carrying a radiation ball as well. They saw that their father was alive and shouted happily, and he quickly heard their voices. But when David took out his binoculars to check, he noticed Lisa's father making a gesture to leave quickly, without waiting for David's response. Lisa's father, as if sensing something approaching, quickly got into the car and fled. Just as everyone was about to return to the car, members of the Monarch organization also arrived at the scene. But before they could wait for the plane to approach, the slope below suddenly began to collapse. The massive tremor of the mountain made it impossible for them to stand firm. They stared blankly at this colossal creature as it slowly appeared before them. Although they alarmed this gigantic creature, Godzilla had no intention of attacking. It simply departed silently from the scene, and as Godzilla left, David decided to continue tracking it. He also wanted to fulfill some of his own regrets. However, this caused a serious disagreement with Lisa and the others. Their original goal was to find Lisa's father, not to search for Godzilla. Therefore, they separated once again. As they walked through this vast desert, they once again lost track of Lisa's father. But as Mary continued walking, her conscience suddenly kicked in, and she revealed her collaboration with the Monarch organization. It turned out that a few years ago, she had offended some people and was forced to flee to Tokyo. She lived a life in hiding, but she never expected that the Monarch organization discovered her true identity. They used this information as leverage promising to help her return home and resolve her troubles if she disclosed her whereabouts. But now, it seemed that the Monarch organization had completely broken their promise, which was why she revealed this information. She hoped to gain forgiveness from them, but to her surprise, Lisa listened and walked away without looking back. And at this moment, the timeline once again returned to the year 1955. David learned that Godzilla was still alive, and he decided to report this to the highest-ranking officer. He had another argument with Tracy. Tracy didn't want the military to use lethal weapons against the monster again. The most powerful weapons humanity had were no longer effective. If David informed them that Godzilla was still alive, it would only lead the authorities to develop even more destructive weapons. However, as a soldier, David had to follow orders. But to their surprise, their control over the Monarch organization was lost after David met Tracy. One of the officers informed them that due to David's unauthorized departure, everything in that place, including command authority, would be transferred to the Navy. Tracy and the others were very angry about this matter. This episode ends here. In this episode, we learned about the situation with the Monarch organization, why David, as one of its founders, was imprisoned by them, and Bernie, who had been missing, finally appeared. Godzilla, whom we haven't seen for a long time, also made an appearance. Let's look forward to what fate awaits the characters in the next episode. If you enjoyed my channel, please subscribe right now. In the previous episode of Emperor's Plan, the enormous Godzilla appeared once again on the screen. Godzilla's massive body signified its dominance in the world of monsters. Kate and the others saw its enormous size. They were so surprised that they couldn't close their mouths. Meanwhile, Tim and the others were hovering in the air, were knocked away by Godzilla. The plane began to plummet rapidly. No one had anticipated that the helicopter would be like a sesame seed in front of Godzilla. In the end, only Tim survived the crash. The intense explosion covered him in dust from head to toe. Tim finally made it to a nearby airport. He started figuring out how to leave and report back to the organization. Unexpectedly, Tim encountered Lisa and Kentaru, who were also preparing to leave. When Lisa saw Tim, she immediately rushed towards him. Before Tim could figure out the situation, he was scolded by Lisa. Originally, Mary, who arrived at the airport with them, had been kidnapped not long ago. Lisa believed it was the work of the Emperor's organization. Tim, however, claimed to have no knowledge of it. Lisa decided to make a deal with Tim. As long as Tim helped her find Mary, she promised to help Tim. In finding David and their father, Tim agreed to it. However, the Emperor's organization, with Weir as its current spokesperson, was not so easily trusting of others. Tim couldn't get help from the organization. Tim could only use his own connections to help Lisa and them find Mary. On the other side, the frost monster that appeared in Alaska last time caused a dramatic increase in radiation levels nearby. 
a massive pillar of light. It seems to be pregnant with something inside, a colossal monster. This sensation made the Emperor's organization nervous. The Emperor's organization also gathered a large number of weapons and equipment. At outpost 88 near the organization, this was to prevent the next monster appearance. However, the organization was only preparing for monster attacks. They did not initiate any attacks. This made some people feel discontented. Jiwa's sister had died in a monster attack. There were many people like her within the organization. The Emperor's organization was divided into two teams. Jiwa rallied many people, and they elected David as their leader. David, relying on his previous authority, he took control of Outpost 88. David stated, from now on, they will take over here. The entire base will be sealed off soon, before the lockdown. David gave the staff two options. Option one was to leave with the belief that the world is still a beautiful place. They leave this place. Option two was to stay, and fight alongside them. Furthermore, David looted all the armaments from the base. He took all the weapons to, the Alaskan snowy mountain where he was last. He planted a bomb in the snow to lure out the, frost monster that had almost eaten him. Just as the frost monster leaped up, and pounced toward the plane where David was, the bomb was detonated. The power of this bomb was extraordinary. Waves of dazzling light twisted together. It created a large crater in the ground. Now the frost monster should have been eradicated. The scene shifts. We return to Mary. In fact, Lisa and the others are in Alaska. When they were captured by Tim, the organization investigated everyone's background. Only Mary's identity had significant issues. She had been hiding it from everyone. Her real name is not Mary but Cora. She used to work at A technology research company called Apex. The company is involved in a wide range of fields, high-tech experiments, scientific software code. The company's top executives personally invited Mary to join the company, because the company saw they are all internet geniuses like Mary. However, after Mary joined the company, she was not given significant responsibilities, because everyone else here was just like her, making her not stand out in this environment. She could only wander aimlessly every day, writing code and programming for her company. She wanted to experience more things, such as the company's neural control interface department, which she had always been curious about, what kind of research that department was conducting. Until one day, she hacked into the company, she paralyzed the system, she witnessed with her own eyes, in the videos, the appalling state of those animals, the animals' expressions of pain, made Mary feel nauseous, she never expected that the company was conducting inhumane experiments, crossing ethical boundaries. So Mary deleted the data, causing the company's research to be completely destroyed. She compromised the company's interests, and she would also face lawsuits and claims from the company. That's why she left her family, the reason why she lived in Japan anonymously. Tim, along with Lisa and others, arrived at Mary's real home. But Mary hadn't been home for over two years. The younger sister who has been secretly in contact with Mary, is very worried about Mary's situation. The younger sister asks Lisa and Kentoro, that if they find Mary, to bring Mary back home. The family doesn't care about what she has done, because family is Mary's true home. Tim has basically confirmed, that Mary was likely taken by, the original technology companies took away. So they went to this AET company. Mary is indeed on the upper floor of the company. The company's executives are confronting her. She says to Mary, the company can leave her alone but with one condition. Mary is now closely associated with the Emperor's organization, so the executives demand that Mary becomes a double agent, to infiltrate the Emperor's organization's operations, and report back to them afterwards. At this moment, Lisa arrives to take Mary away. However, Mary reveals the truth. She initially only wanted to use the Emperor's organization, use its information to get yourself out, but being a double agent has exhausted her. She decides to give up the struggle, to face the consequences with the company, and confront her own past wrong decisions. Lisa persuades Mary to leave the company. Just as they walk out the door, they are immediately taken by members of the Emperor's organization. In the car, Vice Director Weir scolded Tim, because Tim, in order to help Lisa rescue Mary, use its information to get yourself out. The monster invasion alarm system she developed, by falsely reporting monster invasions in the city, causing panic, thereby helping Mary escape. Lisa couldn't sit still, she interrupted their conversation, and made another deal with Weir, she had in her possession, the map of monster sightings left by her father, by exposing it to sunlight, it will appear, the pattern of monster appearances, 
She could help the Emperor's organization locate monsters in advance, and even find David. Her terms are, that the organization helps Mary, to free her from the company's lawsuit. Mary once again found the company executives, but she was intercepted by a phone call. It was a call from Vice Director Weir of the Emperor's organization. Mary could finally go home. She knew it was Lisa who had helped her behind the scenes. After reuniting with her family, she immediately found Lisa and Tammy, and joined them on the journey to find monsters and David. On Tim's persuasion, Weir finally made up her mind to let the public know about the existence and purpose of the Emperor's organization, which is to protect humanity. They are not affected by the monster invasions. The Emperor's organization finally no longer hides in the shadows. But what Tim doesn't know is, Weir's secret deal with the technology experimental company. She, in order to protect Mary, Weir agreed to reveal some exploratory findings of the Emperor's organization. This technology company is not ordinary. It is a subsidiary of Apex. And in the later stages, it is through neural control interfaces that they created Mechagodzilla. Mary knew that Lisa was trying to save her. Lisa must have paid a lot. After saying goodbye to her family, Mary came here. She and Lisa at all. They reunited. Because of their mission, it is not over yet. This episode ends here. Title, Emperor's Plan, Episode 7 Inch, a series about the monster world. At the end of this episode, we see Apex Corporation, the appearance of Apex Corporation. It corresponds to the monster film series. It fills in the gaps in the timeline, and helps us better understand this world. In this world, these enormous monsters, may not have any natural enemies. These humans, will once again face the attacks of the monsters. What direction will their future take? In the Godzilla movies, we can see, that humans, for their survival, will always create powerful machines. So in the next episode, these machines, will they reappear in front of us? Let's wait and see. If you like my channel, please click subscribe. The latest monster appears, a mysterious underground world. It will unveil the mysterious veil. This episode will reveal, David, who is already a hundred years old. Why is he still so young? In the previous episode, David blew up the mysterious crater in the Alaskan Valley. He has been following the monster's trail. And at this moment, David arrives in Kazakhstan. His lifelong admiration, Tracy, was buried here. Now he revisits this place. It stirs up many sad memories for him. After the tragic incident happened back then, the Emperor's organization rebuilt this building. And the organization forbids anyone from entering. Dewar doesn't know their purpose for doing this. But David knows it clearly. The organization wants to prevent the monsters inside from escaping. The scene shifts. It takes us to the Emperor's organization base in 1955. David and the other two are reporting on the progress of their investigation. The naval commander in charge of taking over the organization. He does not acknowledge the research accomplishments of the three. He also points out that the Emperor has been misusing national resources. They have wasted countless time and money on pseudoscience. He is completely unaware of the seriousness of the problem. He firmly believes in the power of nuclear weapons. Godzilla won't cause any significant damage. And David promised Tracy to keep the fact that Godzilla is immune to nuclear weapons a secret for now. David can only keep his words to himself. But the person in charge is pushing the limits. He also accuses them of hiring DR Suzuki. The other party is a former Japanese naval officer. He should not have access to the highest US secrets. Andrew can't tolerate it anymore. He rolls up his sleeves and is about to teach the person in charge a lesson. However, the consequences of Andrew's actions are, the three founders of the organization are demoted to the basement, and that person in charge will definitely report to their superiors. David knows that if he wants to regain power, he must help the general find the monsters. But if he knows that even the most powerful hydrogen bomb can't kill Godzilla, they will create even more powerful weapons. Tracy will never agree to tell the general about this. David is completely caught in a dilemma. At this moment, he looks at the map on the wall. David tells Tracy, since the general wants to know where the monsters are hiding, then let's draw a map for him. The map will indicate all the possible locations where the monsters may appear. After the Lawton incident, all the research notes compiled into a complete report. Submit them all. They'd better do it before the fiscal budget meeting ends. To convince the general, they only have three days to prepare. The current situation spanning decades. Tracy and Andrew's descendant Lisa meet with Taro. 
the two of them follow Tim into the Emperor's organization. The place is filled with various boxes of documents, it was all built by Tracy and the other two. However, there are no photos of them on the wall, there are black and white photos of the general hanging on the wall. Andrew fell deeper into obsession after Tracy's death, he started dedicating himself to proving the theory of teleportation and wormholes. These hardcore conspiracy theories are not recognized at all. After Tim finishes speaking, he opens the room at the end of the corridor. The Emperor's organization has outposts all over the world. Recently, one of the outposts detected a set of gamma rays. The data is similar to when the San Francisco incident occurred. Following that, Alaska, every place Bernie has been involved in, similar gamma rays are appearing. These locations are also marked on his studio's map. Is Bernie predicting the monster's routes, or is he tracking the monsters? But before that, Lisa and the others need to figure out David's motives. Weir says, David and Dewar were just in Alaska, they caused a big explosion. Afterward, the gamma radiation levels in that area dropped to zero, but the data in other areas instantly increased. It even approached, the levels observed on the day of the San Francisco incident. This is not a good sign. What if David creates another explosion? The gamma radiation levels could exceed the limit. Weir asks Lisa and her siblings, to find out David's next destination. But the map they have, was taken by David in the desert. So they have no leads. Tim leads the three young people. They head to the office where Tracy and Andrew used to work. They search through the documents, hoping to find clues about the map. Just then, Lisa discovers an application file. The file reads, Organization member died in the line of duty. David applies for her death benefits, to be left to the surviving spouse Andrew. Further down is the name of the grandmother, Tracy. Upon hearing this, Tim suddenly realizes something. He walks towards the map on the wall. Tim remembers that Tracy died in Kazakhstan, and that happens to be one of the areas with a surge in gamma radiation levels. Lisa has a strong intuition. David must have gone to Kazakhstan. He delusionally wants to rewrite past mistakes, so David is definitely going back to the same place. David returns to the place that changed his life, but Weir doesn't have the authority to cross the border. She can only send an elite team over. Upon hearing this, Lisa immediately volunteers. After discussing among themselves, they decide that Tim will lead the team. Everyone heads to Kazakhstan. After Andrew and Tracy receive David's assignment, they start tirelessly organizing their research notes. In fact, compared to David, who has a military background, Tracy and Andrew's souls and ideals are more aligned. They become increasingly dependent on each other. Love silently sprouts and grows. David saw it all. He can't ignore the sadness in his heart. But he can't abandon his principles for Tracy. Time goes back to the present. Tim and his team arrive in Kazakhstan. The organization provides them with bulletproof vests. Lisa says that this won't work at all. They can't just charge in and fight David. It will only make the situation uncontrollable. What we need to do is communicate and find a solution. Besides, David won't harm Lisa and Kentaru, because he considers them as his only family left. While they are talking, they arrive outside the old building. David's convoy is parked outside. They crawl into the building through a hole in the wall. They follow the traces left by David. They continue deeper into the radiation inside the building. The radiation levels fluctuate around 0, 2 millisieverts. This is roughly equivalent to the level of an X-ray. And this is highly unreasonable. After the core meltdown in this area, here's the next 1000 years. It is not suitable for human habitation. But the radiation inside the building, it remains at harmless levels. In this case, there is only one possibility. There must be a monster absorbing that radiation. Tim is following the lead person. He accidentally steps on an animal carcass. It looks like a large leg, not far from them. There is also a large pile of empty shells in the corridor. These are remnants of insect molting. Insect molting is for increasing body size. They can't imagine how big these things are now. Finally, a few people arrive near the reactor. The radiation has risen to 6 millisieverts. Behind the hole is where Tracy died. A massive crater. It appears before everyone. The hole is deep and bottomless. It emits a faint glow. The entrance is covered in vines and moss. They quickly realize. There are bombs placed around the entrance. Could David want to seal off this entrance? Mary is planning to try to disarm them. Unexpectedly, Dewar suddenly appears. He orders Tim's people to drop their guns. The latter obediently complies. Lisa ignores Dewar's threat. She asks where David is. Just as Dewar finishes speaking, David emerges from the shadows. He agrees to negotiate first. Let's go back to 1955. 
Andrew's drawing of the map is stuck at a crucial point. He marked the locations where the monsters appeared. However, Andrew couldn't figure out the connection. Just then, a small ant crawls into the hole in the map. Andrew suddenly finds an answer to his confusion. He braves the heavy rain to talk to Tracy. The appearance of the ant let Andrew understand one thing. The monsters are likely lurking underground, and their nests are like termite tunnels, crisscrossing underground. That's why the monsters can appear unnoticed. They suddenly appear in different parts of the earth. There's even a possibility that underground connects to another world. It coexists with our surface world. Just as Andrew gets excited, a child's voice comes from the room. Tracy walks over and carries a young boy. Andrew is a bit confused by the situation. Tracy explains the cause and effect to Andrew. It turns out she is a single mother. Tracy didn't intentionally hide it from Andrew and David. It's just that as a Japanese woman, she already had a hard time earning respect here. She didn't confess at first. And later, she didn't find a suitable opportunity to speak up. Tracy's reason for going to UC Berkeley. She hopes that after the war ends, this can give Bernie more opportunities. However, she has been unable to save enough money to bring her son over. This is thanks to the work of the Emperor organization. Bernie's visa was approved about six months ago. The scene shifts back to the present. Lisa asks David why he wants to talk to her alone. David's intention is clear. Godzilla's every action has a purpose. There is another world below. David is so sure because he has entered it before. Tracy and Andrew have also been there, but the Emperor organization refused to believe. Godzilla is not here to harm us. It just wants its kind to stay in the underground world and let humans stay obediently on the surface. So David plans to seal off the underground entrance, severing the connection between the two worlds. Lisa objects upon hearing this, because after David destroys the passage, the gamma radiation readings in other areas increase. If they continue to seal off the entrance, what will happen if the tragedy in San Francisco repeats itself? Back then, David went to see the general with the final report. At that time, the general was about to halt the entire emperor plan. David wanted to turn the tide with that map, but the general didn't give him any chance. David had to play his trump card. He informed the general that Godzilla was still alive. Upon hearing this, indeed, his face changed dramatically. After all, the day Godzilla was bombed with a nuclear bomb, the general was present. David solemnly handed over the report, and it shows that this is the effort of Tracy and Andrew. If it weren't for the selfless dedication of these two individuals, they definitely wouldn't have been able to find Godzilla. David saved his two partners and the Emperor plan, but this action of his would also cause other problems. Now, the time is at present. David tells Lisa, the idea of sealing off the entrance was originally proposed by Tracy. Now, David only wants to help Tracy and Andrew achieve the goals they have worked so hard for. After he finishes speaking, he orders the bomb to be activated. Suddenly, the entire building starts shaking. Everyone runs out in a panic. Mary tries to save Lisa but accidentally falls into the abyss. Immediately after that, a huge beetle-like monster emerges from the ground. It opens its mouth and roars at Lisa. At this critical moment, falling debris hits the monster. Lisa also slides towards the hole with the monster. Seeing this, David quickly grabs her wrist. But in the next second, the entire platform falls. They both fall into the entrance. Then the countdown ends, and the bomb is activated. Will the underground world soon be revealed? The mysterious underground world. It has a time-stopping effect. So, what about Tracy in the underground world? Is she still alive? All these puzzles make me even more excited. If you like my channel, please subscribe to my channel. A thorny wild boar walks out from behind Lisa. Does the thorny wild boar intend to eat Lisa? In the previous episode, since they fell into the center of the earth, the characters have encountered magical weather conditions here. Lisa has also encountered different monsters. What kind of journey will they embark on here? Let's dive into today's episode analysis together. The story continues from the previous episode, where David seals the underground tunnel Tracy fell into years ago. Mary, Lisa, and David all fall into the tunnel. The nuclear power plant collapses. The Emperor organization sends Tammy back to Tokyo. As they deal with the consequences of their public relations actions, they also monitor the increasing radiation levels worldwide. The organization remains vigilant against the appearance of monsters. In another world, David wakes up in a familiar place. He finds Mary and takes her away from the strong electrostatic zone, the magnetic field generated when the tunnel is closed. 
It reacts with the static electricity produced by the human body. It not only affects consciousness, but also affects the environment. The magnetic field can also cause a deadly surge of electric current. After they both reached the safe zone, David explained to Mary, he had been to the world at the center of the earth. In 1962, the emperor organization, with full government funding, carried out an exploration mission to the center of the earth called the Hourglass Project. Before entering the center of the earth, David gave Bernie a small knife as a memento. This exploration to the center of the earth was extremely challenging. The project utilized a gamma ray simulator invented by scientists to attract the earth's monster and draw it out of the tunnel. Before the monster broke out of the tunnel, they timely shut down the simulation, allowing the exploration capsule to follow the monster. They used the monster as a passageway to the center of the earth. They arrived at the center of the earth. Because their understanding of the center of the earth was incomplete, the impact force caused by the monster breaking out of the tunnel resulted in a massive explosion of the unstable external magnetic field. This led to the failure of the project. The base outside the entrance was instantly blown apart. David also perished in the underground tunnel. At least that's how it appeared to the outside world. At this time, Bernie, who had already become mature, lost his mother, and then he lost his uncle David as well. The government also stopped providing funding to the emperor organization. Andrew began to go crazy, solely focused on proving the existence of the monster and the center of the earth. He ultimately died in the Kong Skull Island incident in 1973, according to David's recollection. At that time, their exploration capsule was involved in a flying monster-induced terrestrial event. In the treacherous environment they found themselves in, David and the team encountered titan creatures and areas of intense static electricity. One by one, the members of the exploration team died. Afterward, David was unsure of how he managed to return. He regained consciousness in the real world. He was discovered in a forest in Japan. Subsequently, he was brought under the control of a local medical institution affiliated with the Emperor organization. Upon awakening, David's first priority was to meet Andrew. For this purpose, he even took a hostage in an attempt to escape. The hostage currently held by David is Tammy's mother, until a man takes out the small knife which David sent out. That made David finally calm down. This man was none other than Bernie, and Bernie's appearance shocked David. For David, the failed mission has only been a matter of a few days at most. In fact, it has been 20 years since the Hourglass Project. David was confused. He lost 20 years of his life. When Bernie asked him what had happened 20 years ago, David's memory slowly unfolded. He explained that at that time, they were a group of people. After they landed smoothly, it seemed like they had arrived in another world. Unfortunately, one person fell to death. He intended to contact the control center. But at that moment, a terrifying giant creature attacked them. The others died instantly. Just as he was about to meet a similar fate, a tremendous energy suddenly appeared. He and the monster were sucked in together. When he woke up again, he realized that he had returned to the surface. After learning all of this, Bernie also told Shaw that his mother, Tracy, had died, and Andrew had also met an unfortunate end on Skull Island. Now, the three of them, only Shaw remains. And now, the frequent appearance of the monsters may be related to their previous actions. He hopes that Shaw will not disturb these monsters anymore, and arranges him into a sanatorium. David, until the reappearance of the Titan monster, gradually awakens from the numb obsession he has had for many years. David starts to have strong feelings, breaking free from the shackles of the Empire organization. Bernie also, during the time he discovers David, meets Tammy's mother. Now, we return to the present, where the Empire organization has already assumed that David and the others died in the collapse. However, Tammy is not giving up. He witnessed Mary and Lisa sliding down the tunnel, and he wants to find them with his own strength. After going through so many adventures, they have become like family to Tammy. He goes to his father's studio to search for clues, but unexpectedly, he encounters his father, Bernie. When Bernie learns that Lisa may have been buried underground, he feels immense pain. He finally starts to regret leaving without saying goodbye. In fact, Bernie is also pitiful. He grew up with his mother and grandmother, and he finally had his father, Andrew, and his uncle, David. But one by one, his family members left. In Bernie's eyes, after losing his mother Tracy and his uncle David, his father went crazy studying monsters. Andrew did everything to prove that his conclusions were correct. And as a result, he sacrificed his own life. Therefore, Bernie has reluctantly taken over. 
the legacy of the Empire organization, it can be said that he never wanted to believe in the existence of monsters. For Bernie, his ancestors pursued monsters blindly, which led to the disruption of the world's ecological balance, and they also lost their own lives, which was not worth it. It was until Andrew's file bag was salvaged, that he truly discovered the secrets of everything. He began to search for monsters, not only to prove Andrew's theory was correct, but also to find evidence that his own mother might still be alive. He went to various places to search for the traces of monsters and awaken them. The time is now 2015, and the Empire Organization's ground detection personnel discovered a signal in the underground world that was different from before. This signal had a rhythmic fluctuation, leading them to speculate that it was artificially sent, shifting the perspective back to the center of the Earth. Lisa also woke up. After quickly adapting to the environment, she tried to evade the pursuit of the wild boar monster, but at the last moment, she was saved by her grandmother, Tracy. Lisa saw Tracy emerging from the darkness. The story of this episode ends here. In this episode, everyone goes to the underground world. Tracy also confirms that she didn't die. How long has the event in the underground world been going on? And how long will the next plot continue? It makes us deeply ponder. Will they ultimately escape the danger once again? And what kind of monsters will appear in the underground world? The final episode will be updated next week. Let's look forward to it together. If you enjoy our channel, please do subscribe now tilde. The latest episode of the series is here. In this episode, we finally get to see Godzilla beating up other monsters. So let's delve into the plot. Lisa, who arrived in the world at the center of the earth. She didn't expect to encounter her grandmother Tracy who was reported to have passed away. Tracy, who went missing back in the 1950s, naturally didn't recognize her future granddaughter. She urged Lisa to leave quickly, because this place was the territory of monsters and it was not safe to stay for long. Lisa told Tracy that besides her, two other people fell into the rift. Tracy said that she had been sending signals to the outside world. If your search team follows you, they can discover this signal. They can rescue us. Presumably, the stable fluctuations detected by the detection team it was the signal that Tracy managed to send out. Upon hearing this, Lisa realized that her grandmother had misunderstood. She told Tracy that she wasn't part of the search team. She wasn't a member of the Emperor organization either. Lisa was about to reveal her own identity. Mary suddenly emerged from the bushes. Then, David's voice came from a distance. He was hiding behind a big tree, afraid to show himself, because he was nearly a hundred years old. Tracy, stranded in a different world, still looked youthful. David asked her how long she thought she had been underground. Tracy showed a puzzled expression. She seemed unsure why David asked in this way. She had only fallen into the rift for 57 days. It turned out that Tracy still believed it was 1959. David told her that it was already 2015. There was a temporal and spatial gravitational distortion effect in this place. The outside world had changed beyond recognition. In the end, David showed himself from behind the tree. Tracy looked at him in disbelief. There was a gap of exactly 56 years between them. Only they could truly understand this feeling. David never thought he would be able to see Tracy in his lifetime. He regretfully told her that Andrew had already passed away. Lisa finally stepped forward from the side. She told Tracy, I am Bernie's daughter, and I am your biological granddaughter. On the other side, Bernie told Tammy. He went to the desert to open the rift and lure out the monsters, to prove that the underground network truly existed. If it weren't for the Emperor organization's disbelief in the existence of other worlds, perhaps the San Francisco incident would never have occurred. Tammy was speechless upon hearing this. He had disappeared inexplicably for such a long time. What he had done was just to prove this theory was correct. However, Lisa didn't die in the San Francisco incident. She died because of searching for you. Bernie had nothing more to say at this point, but he had to find a way for humanity to survive, to prevent more tragedies from happening. Tammy couldn't accept her father's indifference, so she refused their request for cooperation. The scene shifted to inside the Emperor organization's base. The gamma ray indices in various locations had stabilized. Although they were still at a high level, it is not enough to trigger the end of the world. We has mobilized all available personnel, restoring the network in most of the outposts. But she didn't continue with the investigation. The suspicious signals detected by the team members, because compared to rescuing the so-called survivors underground, there are more important matters waiting for the Emperor organization to handle. She can't ignore the lives of 7 billion people. Tim feels that this argument doesn't make sense. Perhaps the solution to saving 7 billion people lies in the hands of those three people underground. 
Tim hopes that we should reconsider it. Otherwise, as David said, the Emperor organization will truly be just an empty shell with no real purpose. Weir is simply stubborn. She even told Tim to do his assigned tasks well. Otherwise, she will indefinitely extend Weir's sick leave. Meanwhile, Tracy took the three of them to her campsite. The gamma simulator from that year is still here. She modified the transmission pipeline in it so that it can emit directed gamma ray pulse signals to the outside world. Tracy asked if the Emperor organization had disbanded. Lisa truthfully answered that it still exists to this day. Even her father is a member of it. Tell me about him. Lisa struggled for a while before saying, Bernie is very family oriented. Lisa only chose a few good words to tell her grandmother. David ahead interrupted their conversation. Since Tracy was so curious about Bernie's life, why not go back and ask him in person? As long as this simulator is here, he has a way to bring everyone back to the surface. The three of them wanted to move the machine back to its original position. David couldn't help but joke, if we can go back. He doesn't even know what year we would jump to. He hopes that there would be robotic butlers at that time. Mary and Lisa couldn't be bothered to pay attention to him. The two of them were ready to find a flat place to rest for a while. Hey, seriously, don't, don't go, go far. David and Tracy have precious solitude time. The two of them inevitably talked about Andrew. Tracy wanted to know how he died, because David himself also fell into a deep pit back then. He only heard rumors about Andrew's death. It was rumored that Andrew led an expedition to an island. He wanted to prove that certain theories about monsters were true. As a result, he never returned after that. David slowly narrated the changes of the outside world. Humans have landed on the moon. Various smart products like cars and smartphones appeared. People are still the same. With conflict and victories, after chatting for a while, the two of them decided to go find Lisa and the others. Meanwhile, Bernie finished packing his luggage in Tokyo. He was preparing to make a trip back to San Francisco. He intended to go through the divorce procedures with Lisa's mother. Upon hearing this, Tammy's mother immediately stood up. While speaking, she took off her wedding ring. Ever since the incident in San Francisco, she and her son have been trying their best to contact Bernie. She has been looking forward to the day when the family would reunite. While after learning the truth, Tammy's mother, she didn't have the courage to continue living with Bernie. She just wanted to tell her husband, no matter what happened between them, Tammy should not lose his connection with his father. After Tammy's mother finished speaking, she placed the wedding ring on Bernie's luggage. Tammy who was full of worries, went out to seek alcohol to relieve his worries. He didn't expect to encounter an unexpected person, Tim, who couldn't convince Weir. He still refused to give up on that strange signal. So. He could only discuss it with Tammy. He took out the data on gamma ray bursts. He briefly expressed his own thoughts. Since someone is emitting signals from inside the rift, it means that there is indeed another world inside. In that case, Lisa and the other two are likely still alive. If they want to rescue them, they have to ask for Bernie's help. No one understands this data better than him. Meanwhile, Bernie is watching the video message left by his father, the old man who threw the backpack into the water at the beginning of the story. He is Andrew who went to the island to seek evidence, until his last moment of life. He wanted to prove his theory. This is also one of the reasons why Bernie is so obsessed with the other world. He wants to fulfill his father's wish. Just then, Tim and Tammy suddenly came over. They showed Bernie the data and information. However, Bernie refused to believe in events with very low probabilities, because Bernie couldn't bear the pain of gaining hope and then being disappointed again. He would rather believe that Lisa is already dead. In the end, Tammy convinced her father to join. On the other side, David and the other three carried the simulator and moved forward. Along the way, Lisa couldn't help but ask, why does this place resemble Earth so much? Tracy explained that because it is a part of Earth, just like the axis of the world, it is the polar region between heaven and Earth. Shortly after they walked out, they saw colorful lights. Lisa asked, we are underground. How does the light come in? David asked her to imagine the rift as the rabbit hole in Alice's adventures in Wonderland. They didn't fall underground. Instead, they entered an unknown world. The four of them took a break and continued moving forward. Finally, they found the spaceship that David had parked there years ago. He immediately climbed inside to test it. The instruments inside were indeed intact and undamaged. After all, in terms of the time in the other world, the spaceship had only been there for a few weeks. Now, as long as they connect the wires to the simulator, they can leave this cursed place. Unexpectedly, roars of monsters suddenly came from the distance. David instructed Tracy and the other two to enter the cabin first. He would complete the final assembly. To his surprise, Tracy decided to stay here. Her husband had already passed away. Her son had grown up in her absence. Tracy had already been abandoned by the outside world. 
For over 50 years, she didn't have the courage to go back and face Bernie. She was afraid of disrupting his originally peaceful life. Lisa interrupted Trace's words. These monsters have taken everything from me. Tracy, in order to solve the issue of human survival, she agreed to leave with them. The four of them entered the cabin and fastened their seat belts. David asked them to pay attention to the radar display in front of them. Once this thing starts beeping, it means that the simulator has successfully attracted a monster. When it reaches a distance of 910 meters, David will turn off the simulator. When the monster retreats, it will also pull them into the rift. Just then, the sound of a monster came from outside. The simulator hadn't attracted the monsters from the rift yet, but it attracted the nearby monsters. Its enormous wings stirred up a strong wind. Before the four of them could react, the radar display started sounding an alarm. Something was pulled out of the rift. The monster was only 2,130 meters away from them. The giant creature in the air still refused to leave. Its wings almost knocked the spaceship over. One of the connections of the simulator's wires snapped. David knew that he had to act quickly. He opened the cabin door regardless of the danger. He crawled out and reconnected the wires. The enormous bat-like creature spotted David. It took the opportunity to crawl towards him. Just then, a vague dark figure appeared at the rift. Tracy crawled out of the hatch and stared ahead. Unexpectedly, the three of them had attracted Godzilla. The bat-like creature from earlier suddenly rushed over. It bit Godzilla's neck. The bat-like creature exerted its strength and attacked again. It even sprayed a large amount of saliva at Godzilla. Green slime covered Godzilla's eyes. Godzilla caught the bat-like creature and tore it in half. It threw the creature directly into the nearby rift. The tremendous suction pulled the spaceship in. David quickly ran and caught up. Tracy couldn't just watch him stay behind. She tightly held onto David's hands. Unfortunately, the cabin jerked. It threw off their grip. David knew he couldn't escape this disaster. Thank you. For <laughs> the spaceship, along with Godzilla, was sucked into the rift and David was forever left behind. A group of staff members came to pick them up, then Tammy rushed out and hugged Lisa. It turned out that Bernie had made careful calculations. He had found the rift where they would appear. Lisa immediately hugged her father. She had so much to say, but for now, their priority was to let Tracy recognize Bernie. Lisa told Tracy that Tammy was also her grandson, although the scene of the family recognizing each other was heartwarming. But the sudden appearance of a person confused the four of them. How could Mary's heartless boss be here? It turned out that Bernie and Tim's entire mission was funded by her. Lisa and the others had been missing for two years. A lot of things had happened during this period. Just as they finished speaking, an alarm sounded in the air. Lisa looked back in confusion. The story of this season ends here. Beyond expectation, King Kong appeared at the end as a bonus scene. It is reasonable to speculate that this is to build anticipation for the release of Godzilla vs. Kong 2, which is set to be released in March this year. Although the quality of the series is good, the plot is too fluffy and dragged on. This series is more about establishing the worldview of the entire monster universe. Its complete worldview will help us better understand the plot of the entire monster universe. If you enjoy my channel, Please click the subscribe button for me tilde.